It is great to be here at the second edition of Campus Party Natal. My name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the president of Linux International. I have a variety of other jobs also. But first, we have an advertisement. Tomorrow is Debian Day here at Campus Party Natal, and we're going to have a special meeting at 1900 over in the area over there. So please come on over and hear about Debian, a distribution of the GNU Linux operating system. And I will be there tossing out some of my friends. I only have three of my friends tonight, but I'll have many more tomorrow. For those of you who do not know me, I am a very old man with a long white beard, but I'm not Popeye Noel. Instead, I go around telling people how they can make money and have a great job with free software. This year is my 50th year of programming in the computer business. I've been in the business for a very long time and worked for a lot of different companies. I've been around the world, and I believe that free software is the way to develop software, and open hardware is the way to produce hardware. I come from a very strange country. My country confuses communism with dictatorships. We confuse capitalism with democracy. We think there's only one type of capitalism, and there's really many types of capitalism. We like a game called baseball. We also like a game called soccer, but you call it football. And we think that there's only one type of slavery. Here in Brazil, and particularly in the Northeast, you know what slavery is. You can see slavery. But the opposite of freedom is not just physical slavery. Because when you're a slave, you're told where to go, what to do, who to marry, when to have children. You don't own anything. It all belongs to the master. And when you're an economic slave, you're told where to put the software with your computer and how many people you can, can use that computer and when to upgrade that computer. You don't really own the computer. It's really owned by somebody else. And you definitely do not own the software. That is owned by somebody else. You only get a right to use the software. And that right can be taken away from you. I visited Brazil for the first time in 1996. I found very large universities. I found very large cities. If you ask the people in the United States what's the largest city in the Western Hemisphere, they might say Los Angeles or New York. And if you get all about Sao Paulo, the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere after only Mexico City. I found a very entrepreneurial people. You are. You look for many ways to make money. And I found very rich people living next door to very poor people in places they call favelas. But I also found GNU Linux. And I found that Brazil was using GNU Linux to do all sorts of things. And I found that they had many different conferences on free software. What I found in Brazil in 1996 was a country that had 200 million people, about half the size of the United States. And yet I found that Brazil was exporting billions of reais every year for software that they could have had for free. Now, when I started coming here to Brazil in 1996, I said to Brazilian people, you should use free software. They said to me, oh, Mad Dog, all of our software is free. 
because Brazil also pirates about 86% of their desktop software. And you're laughing about that, but what if that was your software that you wrote and you expected to get paid for it, you expected to make a living off of it, you expected to feed your children with it? Then it's not so funny, is it? So I am against software piracy. I believe that if a person writes a piece of software, they have the right to say what happens to it. And that includes charging money for it if they want to. But I also believe that the best way of creating software for everybody is to use the free software collaborative method. I believe that you should be building hardware here instead of sending all of your money to China. I think you should be creating jobs here for young programmers like you to work on very interesting types of jobs. I believe that you should have that so you can stop the tremendous brain drain that you have of people who are leaving Brazil after attending your universities where the tuition is free. I believe that you should have interesting jobs because when it comes to writing software, the number one reason for writing software or staying with a company is not how much money you make. It is how interesting the work is and the fact that you're working with other interesting people. Money is number four for the reason. And believe me, when you send that much money outside of Brazil, it doesn't come back. There's only so much cachaça that Bill Gates is going to drink. Steve Ballmer drank a lot more, but, you know, he's not with Microsoft anymore. Now, I also found, when I talked to companies in Brazil, and I said, why don't you build the hardware here? Why don't you design the hardware here? They said, it's easier to do it in Taiwan. We just go to Taiwan, they have most of what we need, we tell them what we want, they turn it around in two weeks, and they manufacture however much we want. And the problem with that is that it never builds up the expertise in your own country to design and build and manufacture that type of hardware. And you continue to send that money outside of Brazil. Remember, even though you pirate 86% of your software, somebody pays for the other 14%. And the people that pay for that are your governments and large companies that cannot afford to be caught pirating software. And so there's still billions of reais that leave Brazil because you use proprietary software. And it's also dangerous to your tech future not to have people here who have the expertise to design this hardware and this software. I think I heard one of the speakers talk about a technological park that wants to be built here. That's a wonderful thing. But those companies will not come unless they have the trained and experienced people to help them build the things they want to build. You can put all the park out there you want to, but they will not come. They will not bring their people from the United States to Brazil, or they might bring a few. But they expect Brazil to produce those people that know how to do that work. And if you keep sending those people to the United States and Europe because the jobs don't exist here, they will never happen. Companies have a responsibility more than just creating profits for their shareholders. They have a responsibility to the community and a responsibility to the country. As I said, I come from a strange country, and we have this strange game called baseball. In baseball, you have these three bases, and you have somebody who uses a stick to try and hit a ball as far as they can. And other people try to catch the ball and get it back and tag them out. And if the ball is hit so far away that nobody could possibly catch it, then we call that a home run. And if there's already a, all the bases are full, we call that a grand slam. And it's a very slow sport. 
So the best thing to do on a hot summer day is to sit in the, spe in the bleachers, drink warm beer and eat cold hot dogs and watch this very slow game. So we're now going to play Mad Dog Baseball, but I hope that I can go to Campus B and find some really good beer later on. The batter is up. Brazil is in trouble. You have a high unemployment rate. You have a relatively low manufacturing and export rate compared to the size country you are. A lot of what you export are agricultural products and they don't have a very high markup. Your balance of payments is skewed because of this. You import lots of technological things that you pay 100% duty on and that makes them a lot more expensive than they should be. And you have a large number of households without internet, which for some reason you call the digital inclusion people, when they're actually the digital not included people. A few years ago, Brazil was looked at as one of the rising countries. They were called a BRIC country. It stood for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And now Brazil is not so well thought of, I'm sorry to say. I think it could be. So we're going to say, we're going to get somebody on first base using open source software. We're going to collaboratively design this software all over the world and then let you tailor it exactly to what the customer needs because then you're producing a solution. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Nobody really buys hardware. And nobody really buys software. What they're buying is a solution to a problem. And if they could do that solution to the problem with Legos, or two tin cans with a string, they would. But instead they chose to do it with computers, and that's why they buy the computers. That's the secret. The solution is what the customer is going to pay for. Not the computer and not the software. We're going to leverage the money that you would normally pay to Oracle and Microsoft and Adobe and all those other companies who, who employ people in the United States. We're going to take that money and we're going to pay it to you. And then you're going to buy local food and local housing and you're going to pay local taxes. And all of a sudden you have more people employed so the expense of government goes down. And your taxes per person goes down. Your import taxes go down because it's, the taxes are now taxed on real wealth. And we're going to create expertise and jobs in building complex, exciting hardware and software here in Brazil. But the first base, to get to the first base, you have to teach people how to do this. You have to create what we call open source developers. Now these people can work for proprietary companies. They can produce proprietary software just as well as any good software engineer. But the opposite is not true. A closed source software engineer doesn't necessarily have the skills to produce open source software. They don't know how to use the tools that the community uses. They have a lack of knowledge about the techniques that are used by the open source people. And they certainly have a, no idea about the licensing of making all these different types of open source software work together. That's what you have to learn. That's what has to be taught. And as an example of teaching this in an open way, Dr. Rosalie Lopez of the University of Sao Paulo has created a online schooling system to teach people how to program Internet of Things. The Brazilian government believes that 1% of your population has to be able to program Internet of Things 
in the next 10 years. That's 2 million people have to be taught how to program Internet of Things. We can't do that in the normal way. And so we're creating online programming courses. And 50,000 people have taken her free course, it doesn't cost you any money to take this, a free course to learn how to program Internet of Things with the Arduino. This program is in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. It's developed by native Portuguese speakers. And it teaches you how to do even hardware things using the Arduino. Now in 2002, I came to Brazil, Latin America, to bring the Linux Professional Institute. The Linux Professional Institute does certification of Linux professionals. We do not teach courses. We do not charge you for you to learn. We only certify that you actually know what you're supposed to know. And this is a very small charge given the fact that hopefully you'll make more money. Perhaps you'll get a job or a promotion from taking this test. But you can figure out the best way to learn on your own. It may be reading a book. It may be practicing. It may be working with other people. But whatever way you learn the information is your business. You just take the test afterwards and get the certificate. Now, while I was doing this, I visited a couple favelas in Sao Paulo and one in Rio. And I met some of the people there. They were not stupid people. They were not unintelligent people. They were simply poor people. But by using free software, they were learning computer science and networking. And Marcelo Botanelli, a good friend of mine, who was doing the teaching, said to me, Mad Dog, they used to talk about guns and drugs, and now they talk about the internet and web design. This means a lot to me. It should mean a lot to you. LPI today has a variety of different certifications that we give. One is for people that know nothing about computers at all, how do you use a Linux system? Good enough to the point where they might be able to get a job in an office or in a company that uses Linux. The second level of certifications are for system administrators, network professionals, security professionals, and database professionals. And we've now started to branch out into what we call open source certifications, and particularly DevOps. How do you develop software in a new era of agile programming with DevOps tools? When we started out 20 years ago, we only had a small number of people. In fact, we had zero people certified. But what we're doing this year is breaking out into certifying things like BSD, another fine open source operating system. We're also doing a certification for managers to make sure they know how to manage open source developers and how to license and make open source business plans. And we're doing a certification for Internet of Things. Internet of Things Essentials, we call it, to get people started in Internet of Things programming. We now have 150,000 people in 180 different countries. So we're starting to create it as a membership organization. That the certification holders, you, will be the people who will determine the path forward for Linux Professional Institute. I was one of the founders of it. I am the chairman of the board. But I will be happy to give up my position to the next generation of people to lead Linux Professional Institute forward. We're going to offer more services to open source professionals, but it's going to be the members themselves that drive the organization. 
Okay, so we have a person on the first base. We now need a person on the second base, and we do that with open hardware. In 2012, I brought the, Rose, the Raspberry Pi Foundation to Brazil. I brought them to campus party in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and I begged them to produce the Raspberry Pi in Brazil because I believe the Raspberry Pi in Brazil could be produced for five US dollars more than it is any other place. And consequently, you'd be able to buy it for perhaps $40 instead of the more like 150 US dollars it costs to buy one on the street today. We worked two years with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. We actually produced 10 Raspberry Pis five at the University of Sao Paulo, and five at a small plant in Curitiba. And after two years of working with them, they said no. So I went to a small company in China who produced the Banana Pi and the Banana Pro, and I asked them if we could produce their next computer, the LeMaker Guitar, in Brazil. And at first they said no. But I worked with them for six months, and they finally said yes. And so we cross-licensed that agreement so that we could exchange technologies back and forth between the two countries. And finally, about five years later, we're ready to produce these in very large quantities in Brazil. We have modified them to use Brazilian parts so that most of the parts are made in Brazil. The design modifications were done in Brazil and we feel that the target price will be very competitive with these systems if they were bought in the United States. We feel it's better than the Raspberry Pi 3. It has twice as much RAM, it has flash on the system. It has better heat tolerance. Here in the towel, it's easy to get up to 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. The Raspberry Pi has an operating temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. Therefore, it needs a fairly big fan. We don't need a fan. And not only that, but we run on one watt of electrical power. The Raspberry Pi uses a lot more. We feel the design allows flexibility for people who want to make these in products and gives longevity to the overall board design. These, this board, the system, has actually been made the middle system of what the Brazilian government is using as their IoT hardware platform. The smallest system is called the Pulga. I know a lot of you can't see this, but it's about the size of a 10 cent piece and has an ARM processor on it. This is a little sensor computer that could be manufactured by the hundreds of thousands each day on an SMT line, the service mount technology line. And finally, you need a router system to gather all the information up and we're designing the router system to use the core board of the Labrador so that you'll be able to have a Beowulf supercomputer at a very low amount of electrical power in your home. Third base, open source self-hooded cloud software. The problem with the cloud is that most of it is centered in the United States. Now, as I said, I love my country, but I know we're strange. And whenever your data goes into the United States, all of a sudden, my government can spy on you. And my constitution somewhat protects me, but it doesn't do a, a very, anything for you, right? You have no protections under my law. Right. So you need to get all your data inside of Brazil. And so you need to move your cloud services into Brazil to make sure it's safe. 
And to make sure it's really safe, you should make sure that your, your cloud software is open so even you can look at the software if you want to. There's other problems with this cloud software. It tends to be inexpensive until either you start using a lot of it or the promotions end. And then all of a sudden it becomes very expensive. Now there are a couple of open source self-hosted clouds available. One is from an organization called freedombox.org and their software works on almost any computer system that runs Debian. You'll see in a moment, that's a lot of them. Take a look at freedombox.org. It lets you set up your own web server. It lets you set up your own cloud services, your own tour services, your own virtual private network. It even shows you how to get certificates for free. It's a very interesting system. It was developed by a friend of mine, well, a, a group of friends of mine, one of whom is Eben Moglen, who wrote the GPL 3.0 license. And Wit.com, a company that I've recently become associated with, also has self-hosting, open source, cloud software. There is more. They will come out shortly. So now the bases are loaded. We have a person on each base, and our best hitter is coming up. We're going to create a grand slam. We are going to take applications which exist on the internet already, free software applications like Odoo, which is a point of sale and open ERP system. We're going to put Odoo onto this. And then we're going to put this on the back of an LCD panel with a scale and a cash drawer and a printer and all the things you see at the supermarket or at Bob's hamburgers. And those are point of sale terminals. And you're going to be able to sell those to small business people for a fraction of the price that they pay for the other commercial units. And you're going to be able to teach them how to use that. You can teach them how to make their business run better, and that is what they're going to pay you for. Not for the hardware, and not for the software. Kodi, which is a multimedia system, it allows you to view movies over the web. It allows you to store your pictures, store your music, listen to it, transmit it to your house. It's free software. It exists in many of the commercial smart TVs like Samsung and all the rest of them and LG, they use Kodi in their TVs. You could take an LCD panel, a Labrador, and make a very smart TV and security system and home automation system out of it and sell it to people and help them maintain it. Freedom Box is free software, but it's not easy for your mother and father to use. You could teach them how to use it. You can make a business out of selling it. It's free software. Take it, go ahead, and contribute back to it. There's many more of these types of systems. There's 400,000 software packages available on the internet that's written by 26 million different people around the world that you can use and turn into a business for you. And you don't have to ask anybody's permission. And you are your own boss. We want students, high school students, university students, to learn to do this to make money from small to medium businesses so that they can afford to go to university. In Brazil and most Latin American countries, the university is tuition free. You do not pay for the tuition. And yet 40% of the qualified students who pass the entrance exams cannot take advantage of that because their parents are too poor to pay for their room by the university, the food, the computers, the internet, the books. 
And so these students turn it down. We want to fix that. We want the best students to be able to go to university. Money should not be the reason why students do not go to university. And we want them to use their skills to make their communities better. This year, 2019, is a very important year. 50 years ago, people walked on the moon. 50 years ago, the internet was born as a project known as the ARPANET. 50 years ago, an operating system called Unix was started in Bell Labs in New Jersey. Just a project for fun. It wasn't meant to be a serious computer system. And yet today, Unix and its child, Linux, are the most used operating system on the face of the earth. If you use an Android phone, you're using Linux. If you use the, one of the fastest 500 supercomputers in the world, you're using Linux. If you're using Google or Amazon, you're using Linux. If you're using a Linksys router or, or a D-Link router, you may be using Linux. You could be using BSD. But you're definitely using open source software. And these are the things that happened of that little project. I hope that we will have hundreds of thousands of what we call Project Power Professionals coming out of Brazil and the rest of Latin America. Because you see, all of the things I've talked to you, they're not about me. I'm 69 years old. I won't be programming too much longer. But your lives are just beginning. And your children's lives count on this too. It's not just about you, it's not just about me, but it's also about your country and what you can do for it. And if you tell me, if you dare to say to me, Mad Dog, we can't do this in Brazil. Mad Dog, we're just different. Mad Dog, this may work other places. Then please, don't speak to me at all. Because one of my greatest heroes was a woman who became a rear admiral in the United States Navy during a time when it was only for men. And her name was Rear Admiral Grace Murray Hopper. She was the first modern day programmer in the world. And she said, a ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Ships are made to go out in dangerous waters and to make things happen. With that, I'll remind you that tomorrow is Debian Day, and we're going to have a little celebration here starting at 7 p.m. I have a number of my friends to give out, and I'd be happy to meet you there and give them to you. I have one more friend for tonight. I did those two. Oh, no. This one goes there. But I have more tomorrow. Thank you very much for coming. I'll be around, I'll be here tomorrow and the next, and the next day. So you can take all the pictures you want and ask me all the questions you want. Thank you very much. Leave it there for the next person.
Yes? People want to ask questions. I'm happy to ask questions until the end of my time. Oi, oi. Hi, John, my dog here. I'm here <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> in front of me? Okay. Uh, okay. Good evening. My name is Pino. Uh, I see you now. First of all, sorry about my poor English. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. No matter how poor your English is, it must be at least 50,000 times better than my Portuguese. <laughs> so please, do not apologize. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, talking to you. And I have a question uh, about uh, contributing to free software development. Uh, what could, could we, we have, what could we do to help contributing on free software development? Which step do we have to follow about contributing, start com contributing to free software development? Well, the first thing you should do is pick out some topic that you really like. Assuming if you know how to program, I don't know anything about you, so if you know how to program, you can pick out a product that you like, whether it be a music product or a video product or something, you know, a project that's being worked on. Go out to GitHub or GitLab or one of the other software repositories and start looking at the software. The, most of the projects have what they call a bug list, which is not only about bugs that need to be fixed, but also about things that they would like to improve in the software. And you can pick one of those items and say, I could work on that. I could fix that bug, or I could improve, do that improvement. Now the first thing you should do is look at the software a lot, because every group has software standards for writing their software. They may write it in a particular language, they may write it with a particular style. And what you should do is to try and match that style in writing your code. Because that way, in the future, it'll look like one person has written that software instead of thousands. It's easier if the style is the same across all the software. So you write your patch and you submit it. And maybe the people will look at it and say, well, you did OK, but we really would like to do it this other way. You say, okay, you rewrite the software the way they say, and you submit it again, and this time they accept it. And now you have a better going back and forth with them. You know, after a while they say, you know you're pretty good at doing this, why don't you write some, some of these harder pieces of software? And then you start doing that, and you become part of the development team. Now at the same time, you keep track of this, because if you want to go out and get a job writing software, now you have a track of all the software fixes you've done, all the improvements you've made, you have an email list back and forth that you can show people and say, this is the way that I interact with other people developing software. This is way much better than all of the HR submissions you could do to people who have never written software in their entire life, okay? You get that in front of somebody and they'll say, okay, I want you to come work with us. And if you think I don't know what I'm talking about, this is the way a friend of mine 
a guy named Ken Core, became one of the developers of the Apache web server exactly this way. Fixing bugs, doing simple upgrades, and then he was asked to be a core developer, which eventually turned into a paid job at IBM. Yeah. If you're not a good programmer, I can't contribute because I'm not a programmer. But you can read documentation, and when the documentation is unclear, you can say, hey, this part of the documentation's unclear. But if all you do is mumble about it to yourself, that doesn't help anybody. If you go back to the developers and say, this part is unclear, I think you meant this, they say, oh, well, would you mind correcting that for us? Or maybe you can do translation. There's lots of strings inside of software that needs to be translated properly, not automatically like Google Translate does, but needs to be done properly so that the software makes sense. You could do that. And finally, if you can't do any of that, then just use free software. Advocate its use. Go to your educators, go to your universities, and tell them why they should be using free software to teach computer science. Because when you use closed source software to teach computer science, all you can do is show people what the software does. But when you use open source, they can also see how the software does that. And even, even more, they can help make the software better. And you can't do that unless your name is Bill Gates, right? Or Larry Ellison, another favorite of mine. <laughs> Sorry, Oracle. <laughs> Next question. Excellent, and thanks for your answer. Mr. John Hall, uh, could you share more your opinion about artificial intelligence, please? I lost the microphone up here, but I've, now I've got another one. Um, yes, the question was, can I tell you my opinion about artificial intelligence? First of all, a great hero, another great hero of mine was Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a man back in 1939 who wrote, who wrote the first test for what decides artificial intelligence. The test was simple. You put two things behind a locked door and you talk to each one of them. And if you can't tell the difference between a human being and the other thing you're talking to, then the other thing is artificially intelligent. But you see, I hate the word artificial. That's really a bad term. I think you should use the term inorganic <laughs> intelligence. Because I think of the human brain as being a collection of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen atoms put together into neurons and connected with synapses, and then having small electrical chemical uh, energies flow across them, and that mysteriously is what makes us intelligent. Huh? Well, if you can do that with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms, what about a different type of life form that might be silicon-based? It's just we can't conceive of that. And maybe if that life form is silicon-based, it could be something that we could actually build, like a computer. We may someday be able to build neurons and synapses. We may be good enough to do that. And we may figure out how to program them. Would that be an artificial life form? Or would that be an organic life form like we're used to? So that's the first thing. Don't call it artificial intelligence. Call it inorganic intelligence. And then the next thing is, there's a lot of people go around and say, oh, artificial intelligence is easy because when we, when we get robots to do the simple jobs, we'll just get the people who did those jobs and we'll train them to do more and harder jobs. Right. 
<laughs> now I know, I, here in Brazil, you do have Walmart stores. Go to a Walmart store at about four o'clock in the morning and watch the people riding around on the little scooters. And you say to yourself, can those people be trained to do brain surgery? Because sooner or later, we're going to have autonomous cars. And those autonomous cars are going to take away the jobs of the people driving taxi cabs, buses, trucks, and things like that. The, 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 there are already jobs being taken away by people working in warehouses because they have automated forklifts. That happened 30 years ago. So every time you say, we'll just retrain these people to do something that robots and artificial intelligence can't do, I'm sorry, there's no job that inorganic intelligence will not be able to do. No job. And anybody that tells you any different doesn't know what they're talking about or is lying. Now, as I said, I'm 69 years old. I'm happy that I probably will die before I see this happen, unless some idiot pro prolongs my life, in which case I simply say to them, pull out the plug. <laughs> but you are young enough to need to worry about this. And I'm not saying that you should worry about this by turning away from artificial or inorganic intelligence. Instead, you need to control it. You need to be in charge of it before it becomes in charge of you. And this may bring about such things as, you know, guaranteed money for life for doing nothing. And then your job may be doing something creative, like painting an, another picture or making some music until you find out that your robot can actually do a better job than you. Because remember something, inorganic intelligence never sleeps. It never has to eat. It never has to go to the bathroom. And it can have a generation in 20 or 30 minutes to invent a new one that replaces itself and it doesn't care. So did I answer your question about what I think about artificial intelligence? Did I answer your question? Oh, what else? Do, what, what, what did I say? What? what? No, no. He said it's okay. okay. I neither like it nor dislike it. I just say you have to handle it, and I'm going to be dead. So good luck. <laughs> Next question. Um, so, first of all, it's an honor to be asking you this question, but do you think that, like, artificial intelligence is evolving with each passing day? Do you think that people will, like, realize that it's better to use, say, open, uh, open source artificial intelligences so people can see, like, the, what's going on behind it, like, the ethics of it, you know? Oh, absolutely, make you know, inorganic intelligence, open source, for God's sakes, please do that. Uh, do not allow some nut in some far, because you see the difference between creating a nuclear bomb and creating a highly intelligent inorganic life form is not billions of dollars and highly destructive radiation that's gonna eat your brain. <laughs> It's something that somebody could do in a small room with modern day hardware and nobody would know it. So, you know, the thing about artificial intelligence or inorganic intelligence, <coughs> it's getting cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster and better and better. And sooner or later, somebody's going to do it. There's either going to be a good person who creates it the right way or a bad person who creates it the wrong way. And if, how many of you have ever read a book by a man named Isaac Asimov called I, Robot? 
If you have even thought the word artificial intelligence and have not read that book, please do. <laughs> because that book gives both sides. It ends up being a happy tale. It could have just as easily have ended up being a very destructive story. You need to understand the difference between the two. Did I answer your question? I can't hear you. Shake your head. I answered your question. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Move it closer to your mouth. <laughs> sorry. Good evening. Uh, my question is, well, I, I have to start talking about uh, a little story first. I started using Linux since 2014, and since that day, uh, that year, I've tried to convince people to change to Windows from to, uh, to Linux. But uh, I, try <laughs> I try very hard to, to, to convince the, my colleagues the, from college, but they they think uh, the Linux is way harder than using Windows. But I, I tell them it's, a, uh, it's the contrary. It's not like this. And the, my question is, resuming everything, everything uh, what could I tell to my friends uh, to change from Windows to Linux? The, uh, the right answer to uh, convince them. Well, first of all, it is a hard thing to get somebody to switch from one to the other because they feel comfortable with that one answer that they've been using for a very long time. So one of the things you might have to do is look for somebody that's just starting out in computers and get them to start using Linux instead of one of your friends that's entrenched in it. These days, many people only use a web browser and you know a couple of other tools like a word processing package. They don't use a lot of the very specific programs they used to use. Another thing that has happened since you started with Linux is that Microsoft has become a lot less dominant in the world it used to be that if you thought about graphics, you thought about Microsoft Windows. Yes, there was a few nutcases who used Apple, but that was really expensive. And so most people used Microsoft, and Microsoft became the standard. But then all of a sudden, things started to happen. The browser came out, and the browser had its own set of scroll bars and buttons and things, and people couldn't just use their notebook to write down what button to push, and what thing to do to create a program to work. And so people started being a lot less dependent on Microsoft Windows for doing their work and started knowing more how the thing worked or what it did rather than just push this button, push this scroll bar. So you may find that people who three or four years ago were very hesitant to do it, are much more likely to do it today because, gee, they already use Firefox. Gee, they already use, you know, other tools that are free and open source software, and they just don't know it. The other thing you can do is set up a system to actually show them, sit down with them and walk them through it so they can see for themselves most of the people who say that Linux is too hard to use have never actually tried to use it. They just listen to somebody else saying it's too hard to use. It's a lot like the people that listen to my president. They actually never sat down with a gay person. They actually never, you know, went through a lot of the hardships that they're against. They've, they've never been an immigrant from another country. They've never had to go begging for food. And so they can't even imagine what it's like. They've never had their skin be anything other than white. 
so they don't know what it's like in my country. So making them sit down and actually using the software is one way to get them to say, sure, I'll try that out. I had a friend of mine who's 80 years old. About five years ago, her husband died. He was the technical one in the family. She's not bad, but she started using Chromebooks. She loves them. She thinks this is way easier than using Windows. Because, hey, everything's up in the cloud, and all she has to know is how to use a browser. So try again. Maybe it'll work. But more importantly, go back to your high school in your neighborhood. Find those five or six students at the high school in the computer club who are interested in computers. Find out how many of those people are using Linux. A lot. OK, thank you. I'll keep sure. trying. Are there any more questions? Because if there's not, I'll be around tomorrow and the next day. Okay. See you later. <laughs>